Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first lecture in the Studio Art Department's Fall Lecture Series. I'm Gerald Auten, and I direct the Artists in Residence program. Could everybody turn off your electrical devices? Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Black Family Visual Arts Center, where we gather today, is situated upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki people. And it's a great pleasure to introduce to you today our fall artist in residence, Anna Hepler. Anna, who was educated at Oberlin College and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, is a sculptor and printmaker based in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Her work, which is both handheld and architectural in scale, overturns first impressions. Wire forms flatten into drawings, clay impersonates metal, plywood coils like rope, plastic inhales and exhales. Hepler values embarrassment, uncertainty, blunder, and fragility as active agents in her studio process. A former Henry Luce Foundation Fellow in Seoul, Korea, South Korea, <laughs> she has completed residencies at Roswell Artisan Residence Program, Tamarin Institute, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, Archie Bray Foundation, Surf Point Foundation, Montello Foundation, and McDowell Colony. In 2016, Anna Hepler was awarded a fellowship by United States Artists, and more recently has received support from the Harpo Foundation, Nancy Graves Foundation, Gottlieb Foundation, and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Hepler has exhibited widely, and her work can be found in the collections of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, the Tate Modern in London, and the Portland Museum of Art in Portland, Maine, amongst many others. Please join, we are happy you're here. Thank you for coming. I'm really excited you're gonna be here for the term. She, are you now on Dartmouth email? You're not? <laughs> I think you are. But yeah, I mean, if you want to contact Anna and have coffee or something, um, you know, I think she's on email. If not, contact me, Gerald Lawton, Dartmouth.edu. Anyway, please join us for a reception immediately following this talk out this door to the right, and uh, please welcome Anna Hepler. Thanks so much, guys. Um, it is so great to be here. This is really one of those invitations that you just cannot turn down. And I feel so much gratitude to have these weeks, couple months here um, with you all. So thank you, Jerry, and um, thanks all. And I know you guys are probably required to be here, but thanks for coming anyway. I really, I really you know, it, it, it's a little demoralizing speaking to an empty room. So, um, you know, your bodies mean a lot to me um, in this exchange that we're about to have. Um, so, think, thinking about this talk, there's always this moment where I'm like, what am I going to do differently this time? Because, you know, it's a chance. And I was like, I know what I'm going to do differently this time. I'm not going to get nervous. <laughs> totally didn't work. Um, anyway, I'm, uh, I wrote like a little thing, and I have a little preamble to my little thing that I wrote, which is, um, all of it, maybe you want to look at something else, um, which will just hang on this image while I, um, it's like a philosophical little piece. Um, but for starters, um, maybe we can dim the lights. Should we do that, Jerry? Um, for starters, I wanted us to think about like where we are right now. And by that, I mean like on our butts in these chairs in this space. And then I wanted to like think about what's above us and like good. through, that's good, through the um, ceiling and through two more floors and out the top of the building and into the sky and here in the upper valley and then 
the stars and planets and everything that's above us. And then just for another moment, bear with me, we'll go down and imagine ourselves in the other direction, finding ourselves on this earth, on some kind of bedrock that I don't know, um, and going deeper down. And then here we are, um, humans in our little theater of humanity on this Earth's crust, which is so small, right? And we're held here by these amazing forces underneath us and above us. And here we are, a collection of us together in this room. It, it really is a kind of weird magic, maybe. Um, so, so this talk is a little piece of human theater. Um, and uh, as I was thinking about it, um, I wrote this very short thing, which is very much my current thinking about uh, life. Um, and it goes something like this. Uh, we are each a fragment, a leaf or a feather, suspended, tethered in every direction by a complex web of connections. The connections are both real and imaginary, spatial and conceptual. They are people in our lives, our ancestors, our present community. They are our children and the friends that have become our chosen family. The web is built from countless serendipitous moments that steer our actions and decisions, invisibly guiding our lives and shaping them. I'm focused on these unsung parts, the parts I cannot exactly know. And so I stand here before you as a fragment, floating in just this kind of intricate and infinite web it would be impossible to retell the story of each minute and separate influence. I was brought here by my privilege, by the fluid pathways of whiteness, by the love of my parents, by the encouragement and collaboration of friends. I'm not here alone, and I'm never working alone. I'm here with you, and we are now here together. So with that, <laughs> now we can just dive into the materials, right? Um, I know my work is mostly uh, sculptural and exists in printmaking too, but I never did take a sculpture class, which will become perfectly obvious when you see my work. And uh, my root is really in printmaking. And I'll just explain a little bit how and why. Um, these are some little shaped wood blocks on the bed of a letter press, and I, I sort of fix them with double stick tape so that I can be very improvisational about how I um, set up a print as I go. So it's not so much of a fixed thing, but kind of a, a moving thing. But what I love about printmaking is the way that it captures the absence of a thing. It's not unlike, you know, footprints in the snow, where it's like a, you're able to reconstruct actions by way of what's left behind. And printmaking is the same way. It's all about these traces of different materials, like wood looks like wood. It's like you understand on that piece of paper on the right what material we're talking about, but it's not there anymore. So it's just the traces of that thing. And um, so I love this interplay of a material being inked and used and transferred to a flat sheet of paper, a material that itself was a sculptural thing. And then it brings you back to the block that you made and um, the block can have a second life like as a sculpture. And so everything starts to feel like it has this possibility to be translated into something else. If, if I'm making any sense at all. The way a woodblock can become a sculpture, the way the sculpture could then get inked up and printed, you know, hypothetically, and around and around you go. So printmaking is at the center of what I do as a sculptor um, as well. 
This is just an image of a little uh, ceramic sculpture on the left called Monkey Business. And on the right is a dry point that is a, you know, me taking time, looking at the sculpture, drawing it, and making a print from it. So printmaking also offers me this chance to look at things a second time, think about them, translate them, um, engage with them in a new way, and often learn something different about the original sculptural form um, than what I had thought before. Here's another one. Um, oh, and by the way, the print uh, on the right is in the show. And then this little um, kind of nothing of a sculpture on the left is in the show, too. Uh, it's funny about those incidental moments in the studio, and then they stick around, almost like a bug in amber. I was thinking that that was the perfect analogy. Sometimes there's like a scrap or a little moment, and you don't even know why qualitatively it sticks around, but then it does, and then you formalize it in the context of an exhibition, and it seems like it's never going to go away. And this little scrap of clay is one of those objects for me. It's one of my bugs in amber. And on the right-hand side is just the translation of the marks from either side of the sculptural form as a print. So printmaking as a way of investigating things. And here's just another for, you know, to really drive my point home. Um, and here's an example of a woodblock that created such a terrible print, and I, I decided not to print it, and it became this sculpture. And I love it as a sculpture. It's almost like became a piece of fabric because I kept cutting the wood apart and recombining it with these little homemade steel staples. This is called attic. And then just thinking about the spirit of printmaking then a little bit more abstractly, the way in which one thing is translated into another thing and around and around you go. This was a small ceramic sculpture that I made, and it is what gave um, me the inspiration to make a bigger piece with those same double lines. The double lines in the first one were the result of following specific coils with my glazing, but of course in the second one, it's just an arbitrary um, kind of drawing, but the two relate really nicely. So I still feel like the root of all of this is printmaking. Also the way in which the three-dimensional forms are coming from flat stock most of the time, from flat material, and sort of built into three dimensions. So my work also goes between 2D and 3D a lot, which you've already seen examples of, but there's some more explicit ones. This was an installation I did in Seattle at a place called Suyama Space, and on the left it's an inflatable that is constantly in a state of flux where it's blown up, it eventually lifts off the ground, and then it starts deflating, and it, it you know collapses onto the ground and then inflates again. And it was shown alongside this woodcut on the right um, by the same name, Bloom, um, that I thought of as sort of like the, the idealized blueprint of the, of the you know, funny, messy, constantly moving sculpture on the left. And so that combination of um, the, the idealized plan and then sort of like real life on the left um, interested me. The, the woodcut on the right was um, about 16 feet by 16 feet, so I used whole sheets of plywood on the floor and cut them, and we printed them in sections using wooden spoons, a whole group of us, you know, because it's too big to run through a press. So then you just, um, you know, use other means, and then was reassembled for this show. And the inflatable was made out of um, plastic bags that were uh, sewn together and um, I used a bounce house blower to inflate it and deflate it. And here's um, an image of it deflated with the print in the background and then another version of it that I did at the uh, John Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, a couple of years later, really thinking about the drawing of its structure. Um, so speaking of drawing of structures, here's another example of the 2D to 3D or 3D to 2D. I was making um, these inflatable smaller sculptures and I found that if I deflated them underneath a piece of plexiglass, I could sort of trace the random marks of how they were constructed as a sort of print. And so I, um, 
I made some of those and found them to be so much like the tape, so, so um, obedient to the original form. Something really came alive um, for me in those. And then this is a, a even more circuitous process, so bear with me, but I was building some little like scrappy forms out of um, like the veination patterns and in insect wings, which I've always really, really loved. And um, they looked like this. They were like scotch tape and really homely. They it would like fit in my hand, the palm of my hand. And I, but I was curious what it would look like if you borrowed that kind of line, like a very specific quality of line in order to build a form. And um, I ended up photographing these and then blowing them way up and making cyanotypes out of them. So talk about translation, so many translations in this process. Um, never knowing like where I was going or what the end point would be. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then this one is, an, is a bit of an outlier, but it's connected to this show um, around the corner here because it was a print that I made um, just out of my head. Uh, and I just, it's one of those prints, kind of, it's another bug in amber actually because it, it just stuck with me. There was something about it that felt very alive and essential um, to me. And I, I pulled it out maybe 10 years after I made it. And I was like, how could this be like the plan for a sculpture? Like how, how would I extrude, could I extrude this as a sculpture, this, this um, woodcut? And so I ended up making two different pieces. The one on the right is in the show, uh, made out of plywood. And the one on the left is made out of ceramic. So in this, in this rare case, going from 2D to 3D and thinking about how do, how do you translate a drawing? How do you make a drawing come alive as a sculpture? And, and what happens when you do? So um, another way that I often <laughs> occupy myself in the studio is by following a particular material. And you know it really helps if it's like from the trash because that just means there's probably a lot of it and um, doesn't cost anything. So one of those materials that I've been using a lot is cardboard. Um, and I noticed it, I mean, I've, I, I noticed and used it for a variety of different qualities that it has. It's like a highly engineered material. It's so amazing. Um, but I was looking at the edge of the cardboard, like the cross-section edge, and realizing that it's one of those lines, like an insect wing line, where it's so specific, right? Like it's, it's something we all recognize. We all know this, this pattern, and we know it to be cardboard. And um, I, you know, I looked at it. I was making some prints, thinking about it. And uh, then I actually you know, cut slivers of it in order to print it. This is like a pressure print that I made on a, on a letterpress. And that was kind of cool. I like the graininess of that type of print. Um, and then I started building with it. I started thinking like, this is exactly the printmaking translation. I was like, well, maybe it's not the print. Maybe it's the plate, you know? So I started making the, this was a puzzle. Um, this is also in the show that I made, just making shapes out of this material. Um, and then finally, I built this piece. It's in the show. It's called Cataract. And um, it's a little hard to see, but the image on the right, I was just trying to show you how thin the whole piece is. It's, it's like little eighth of an inch thick slivers of cardboard, which I just glued one to the next to the next and created almost like a textile out of it. But it, it's like a textile that has its own like, like structural integrity. Um, I, I didn't know how it was gonna behave. It was one of those things that had um, its own magic in the sense that um, I, I made it assuming it was going to be this sort of flat, like rainbow shape hanging over the dowel. But as soon as I put it on the dowel and then with ambient like moisture, you know, humidity or whatever, it, it started bowing and sort of having its own sculptural presence on the dowel, which I really loved. I always feel like the pieces that I make that are the most what, um, like, the most interesting to me are the ones that 
that really have a life of their own uh, where I can't really take credit for how it comes together in the end because it it feels like there was something else I was supposed to learn about the behavior of what it does or how it how it came uh, how it appears in the end um, almost like almost like as artists were more channels than anything else to just you know, make possible this kind of experimentation and then learn from whatever happens. So um, sticking with cardboard a little longer here, also looking at the shadows of cardboard, which are so beautiful. Um, there's a print in the show where I created basically a negative for a photographic plate just by making one of these cardboard sheets. And um, so the shadow made me think about how you could, you know, make a cyanotype in this way, or you could, you know, make images by using that shadow. Shadows are magic, too. Here's an installation that I did way up in um, Down East Maine uh, in an old church there. It's called Undertow, and it was um, all cardboard slotted. And uh, it, you know, I just it went to their recycling center, I used the cardboard, and then I brought it back to the recycling center. Um, and then using it for dioramas and for small work, which makes me think of it in a different scale. Um, so then I started imagining this piece like a billboard um, of cardboard, and I built it out of ceramics at um, VCU in Richmond. Um, and it went into the kiln, and then the quarantine happened, and it stayed in the kiln for seven months. <laughs> it's crazy. And here are some, some pieces from that. I really love the shadows on these corrugated pieces. I love the way um, the cardboard, when it breaks, and it didn't matter whether it was ceramic or paper, but when you have, when you, you know, fold a piece of cardboard, what the, the sort of wave pattern on the inside does is, anyway, so beautiful. So shadows, you know, I feel like this is, this is a moment to just acknowledge that in our creative work for all of us in the studio, we are the inventors of what we do. We, we invent the game. We, art can be pretty much anything. And we say what it is for ourselves. We decide how big it's going to be and what materials we're going to use. And then we decide how it's going to be assessed for ourselves. And that's up to us, too. And so it's like this wonderful, you're, you're wondering what this has to do with shadows. I know. But the thing is, is that it's like our shadow material is what I want to say, psychologically speaking. I feel like our work is this great opportunity to see, to have come forward through what we do all of this, you know, subconscious material. Um, but I think that's, it's kind of an amazing thing to remember that we are the authors so much of uh, the whole thing, from soup to nuts, as they say. And so if we're also miserable and brutalizing ourselves in the process of making it, which also seems inevitable, by the way, that's also up to us to shift, which I think is also a good thing to remember. Um, so shadows, okay, shadows. Um, shadows, they are really important. It's, it's because of shadows that we see things in 3D, that we can perceive distances, that we, so many, so much of our perception relies on the presence of a shadow. And shadows are three-dimensional forms. I love remembering this. And you only really remember it when there's like a mist or some sort of atmosphere that shows you the way that light and shadow plays through space. But the shadowed side of something is a three-dimensional, it's like a whole volume is what I'm trying to say. It's not just the cut out, a cartoon flat shadow on the ground. Um, and I uh, was at a residency, I, was, I brought my potter's wheel for some reason. I was throwing these uh, ceramic cylinders and I decided to do a project where I was going to cut into them and photograph them. 
and uh, not unlike the cardboard piece that I showed you where I feel like it had sort of its own magic that was not within my control. I feel like these shadow studies, and there's a couple of them in the show, which is why I'm talking about them here, um, have some of that same uh, kind of magic about them. There's this incredible um, flattening or like abstraction that happens with these um, where you stop kind of understanding the spatial field, or at least that's what I, it felt like as I was looking at these um, and constructing them without really knowing what I was even looking at. And I, I show these to you in part because I also don't know what they are. I still don't know what they are. Maybe they don't have to be anything, but I just find them still so kind of captivating and curious at the same time. Um, so they keep me coming back. Uh, I was in this studio that had a, a, a um, what do you call it, canvas floor. So I literally was just plunking these down on the floor and using my phone, you know, to like photograph them in all these different ways. Um, I love it when you can see the wet clay, like the, the finger marks from having, you know, um, made the, the cylinder in the first place. And you can feel the wetness also in the cut edges, I think, of the clay. But after that, they almost become little um, architectural models or something. That lip in this one, that just that fine line. And then the shadow does the rest. So what does the shadow show us? The shadow in this one is almost the illustration of form. Um, without the shadow, it would be very abstract indeed. Um, and I have to say, these got weird. But cool, right? Like, what? So there's another bug in amber right there. So I, it's like, it's so neat in those moments of making work, which is definitely not the majority of moments, where you're like, what is going on? Like, this is so weird. Um, this is so cool. Like, I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what it's showing me. And to feel so totally alive in the moment of wondering. Um, so I was, I was, you know, at another residency. You guys probably think all I do is go to residencies, which isn't really true. But this one was neat. It was in the middle of literally nowhere in Nevada, and I couldn't because I flew out there really bring any art supplies. So I made some adobe, adobe from the dirt and water. I just made some forms to look at in the beautiful desert sun, and then I just uh, left them there. But thinking again about shadow and ruins and architecture, and then I found that some of the, these sort of imagined ruins reminded me of letter forms, and um, I kind of wondered if you could cast a shadow that would say a word. Uh, which would be really cool. I don't know what word to, you would choose, but um, there's something, again, very weird about these to me. But they exist because of, or they're interesting because of the shadows. And, and your sense of the material, too, I think. Um, and this is just another printmaking translation where, so I was making those and really enjoying the shadow play. And then I was in a show with two other artists, um, Elizabeth Atterbury and Gordon Hall. And the three of us um, had a show together at the Center for Maine Contemporary Art. And so I made our initials in clay as the signature stamp for our show, which is a printmaking reference, too, come to think of it. Um, so that's what this weird thing is. Um, another huge influence uh, is um, games and puzzles on my work. By the way, this is my fun, this is my only factual thing this whole evening, which is that dice as a, a, a thing to use in games have been found to be as old as 5,000 years old. And in cultures 
totally widespread from each other, like there could not have been, been any cross-pollination, like, you know, um, Egypt and Scotland, both in like 3,000 years ago, had dice. And they were made from the knuckle bones and were initially just four-sided and then later became six-sided. Um, but it's an ancient uh, gaming form, gaming object. And I just want to point out that every single human culture on this planet has a game and game playing tradition. So it feels like a very primary way for people to rehearse um, and strategize and divine um, information. Isn't that satisfying? To see the similarities, dominoes and cards. And of course, the precursor to the playing card is tar the tarot deck. So divination was one of the primary drivers of game playing. And as I was thinking about games in my own work, because I love the improvisation and the sense of play, um, I started looking at game boards online. And it's only recently, of course, that people ever you know, purchased a game. You always made your own games. Like, you know, if you were on a long voyage, you would scrimshaw some kind of beautiful cribbage board or something. Or if you're, you know, you just need a, a quick solution, a um, piece of plywood and a drill. Um, but I love looking at these homemade game boards. I kind of think we should all run home and make game boards. <laughs> They're so beautiful. Just as like abstractions, I think this one is, is this part cheesy? This one's part cheesy. Do you guys even know what part cheesy is? I mean, I would play part cheesy if I had a board that looked like that. Look at that. It's so beautiful, right? So there's something about seeing in a game board or in a collection of blocks or in a puzzle piece, there's the invitation to engage with what you're looking at. And in my own work, I love the visible way in which something is made. And if, in addition to that, it has almost like a modular game-like component to it, it just feels like it comes alive. Because as a viewer, you can make and unmake the thing that you're looking at. You can, you can actively participate in, in its making. This was a thank you card that I made for a friend. This was one of my first homemade puzzles. Uh, you have to take it all apart in order to spell the word thank you. And this is a piece that's you know, in the show and on the poster. Um, and it comes apart into a few pieces. But it's really, it's not even so much about doing the puzzle, right? It's, it's about the potential of things to come undone and then come back together again. It's the, the fact that we understand this language, you know, like Tinker Toys. So um, these are some images of the making of one of the pieces in the show where I literally um, just wanted to use every scrap of a piece of plywood and I drew in advance each of these shapes and pieces not knowing how it was going to go. And then I um, drilled holes in things and I came up with this nifty dowel and steel cotter pin connection point concept. And I just started drawing with these pieces and parts. I was actually initially hoping with this that I could build something and then hang it and the whole thing would slump, you know, because of course these are um, swiveling uh, connection points. They, they don't hold things in a rigid way, if that makes sense. But that didn't work out. Um, maybe another piece down the line. But I really loved the, the feeling of the drawing uh, of these lines and also the dots as you know both structural but also visual and also the empty dots where 
I didn't end up using a connection point. Another example of a game and a ceramic um, sculpture that I made, which I called Jigsaw for some reason, um, where it slots together and it's different every time. And maybe that's part of what it is for me too, you know, not wanting to be bored with my own work. And so if you make a modular sculpture, then you're kind of figuring it out from scratch every time you put it together. So another thing I think about a lot in my work is scale. Um, I love both the miniature, the handheld, um, and the gigantic. Um, I love folk art. This is a this is a tonala, a Mexican tonala ceramic bird that I found at a thrift store at one point, and it just goes with me everywhere. Um, it's funny how objects can take hold in our lives. It's another bug in amber, you guys. This bug in amber thing is really taking off. Um, but I also love imagining things on a large scale in the form of like a diorama. All you have to do is have a few little like people in your studio and just put them next to anything and it's like presto, changeo. Um, you know, you've got something gigantic, literally gigantic sitting on your desk. So being able to envision things this way, I did a whole show in Portland of just uh, in a shop window where you would look through these little oculuses and into the, a room of just different kinds of installation ideas. And um, there's something so freeing and fun, like super fun about thinking in this way. And you know, it'd be so different without those people giving you a sense of scale, right? Um, but it was actually this, um, these dioramas that uh, made way for my first installations because a curator from Seattle came and saw the dioramas and was like, could you, could you actually make that? And, you know, when you're, sometimes, sometimes you just say yes for the hell of it. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I tried. Uh, so this is uh, aluminum rods and PVC discs connected um, in a sort of cloud shape. Um, it was an attempt to translate one of those diorama ideas in, you know, in, into 3D for real. Um, there's a permanent sculpture actually at UNH in Durham that I made from this kind of building system. And speaking of miniature, so going from the small to the gigantic, um, the table that's in the show, for those of you who haven't um, looked in the gallery yet, this is one of the pieces that's in the show, this tabletop. And I, I really, it's maybe the most fun part of the show for me is setting up these tabletops because it is where you can collide little scraps of things from the studio and incidental, um, objects alongside deliberate things that I've made, small sculptures and a print, and it becomes just like a playground surface, like an imaginary plane upon which you can um, just have some fun. So there's a couple figures in this show, um, one of which is on this table, the other of which you'll have to find. It's in there though, I promise. Um, and the little figures are bronze. Um, I carved them out of wax and then cast them. So something about the kind of easy play of working small and then the exhilaration of working large because when you work large, do I have any really large things here? When you work larger, there's almost like a, a giddiness that takes over because it's beyond what you can do yourself. Um, like this one, uh, where y y you have to relinquish control to work on the scale, and you have to give in often to working with a team of people, which is always amazing, and um, the surprises that come from stretching yourself. Um, so this is a piece that was made out of uh, plastic that had been thrown away, which we cut into strips and sewed into these net forms. And it hangs around a skylight at the Portland Museum of Art um, for this show. 
and it's called the Great Hall, H-A-U-L, but it's located in the Great Hall. Um, and yeah, so being able to sort of flex your, uh, your limits to both ends has always been something that really I've enjoyed. This was another one that um, the light, the way the light came through and cast shadows on the floor was, it was nowhere in my preconception of it. It was part of the magic of it. Um, on site, it almost looked like it was made of glass or something else, like an underwater world. I take no credit for that. It's just its own thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, making maquettes for things that you want to make bigger, um, which we've already seen. And just thinking large sometimes in a material that seems like it doesn't want to go there. And then you see something like this. These are granaries, so for storing grain. And they're made out of ceramic. And, I mean, holy shit. That's so cool. So... There, it's always like we can do more than we think we can, um, but probably better off with, with um, help. And I just also wanted to bring in um, a few images of collaborations that I, I have done with my um, friend Elizabeth Atterbury. Um, by the way, she has a solo show up right now at the Clark Institute in Williamstown. And the two of us are going to be giving a joint lecture there on October 11th, if you happen to be in that part of the state. Um, she and I just finished this tile um, mosaic as part of a Percent for Art project. I don't know if that category of work, it's like public art, I guess you would call it. It's installed in a new courthouse that's just south of Portland, Maine, in Biddeford. And neither of us had ever made um, tile before. And um, we came up with, this is an image of it in, in place. And uh, we each kind of came up with a strategy of texture that we wanted to try using. And then we brought all the pieces together and then built it piece by piece onto the wall. A very satisfying project for me. Um, I really love working in collaboration with other people. And also, in this sense, in the public realm, you're working in collaboration usually with an institution or a, a place that has its own agenda as well. So it doesn't feel like the kind of work, like a charcoal drawing that's like straight from your mind and hand and onto the paper. It has, it's tempered by all of the forces that come together to sort of make it possible. And we also did um, a glass tile mosaic in the entrance of a high school in Maine, um, influenced by um, like patterns in textiles and weaving. So, I, I mean, I, I guess it's been a long time since I had a normal job, and so. Because I'm you know, self-employed in all these different ways, I wear a lot of hats. And this is just one of the hats that I wear. Um, and in closing, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the ecology of the studio and maybe going towards a kind of personal ecology. Um, and maybe we should look at acrobats again, because <laughs> because they're, I don't know, because they're fun. Um, but um, I've been taking these walks here in Hanover out to, um, what is it, Reservoir Road. And there's that section of Reservoir Road. It like turns into dirt. And then you're like in these woods. Suddenly, you're in these like magical woods. The woods around here are really beautiful. They're, the trees seem bigger and healthier than the ones in Massachusetts. Um, and I was looking into the woods and seeing all the fallen logs. And, you know, like when the trees are growing, they're, they're you know, usually quite straight and anti gravitational in their upward motion. And then they fall. And when they fall, they often like break against the ground, sort of into chunks that start to follow the contours of the earth. 
And then as they get older, of course, they start melting into the earth. You know, you see the moss growing on them, and I guess that's when they become like nurse logs, or maybe they're nurse logs the whole time. You guys probably know more than me about this. But there's just, I was looking at those woods and these trees, and I was feeling like, I just wanted to be one of those mossy logs that's like half in the earth and, you know, like melting into the environment. Like, I don't know if it's like my age or something, but like, I don't feel like I'm interested in, in the hard edges of my identity anymore. And so this idea of like melting into your environment and suddenly being able to be uh, so directly available to all these other life forms and, you know, m mushrooms and plants just seems really exciting to me. So, so you're wondering why I'm talking about this. So getting back to the studio and thinking about the ecology of the studio um, and thinking about ourselves in these webs so infinitely connected in our environments to, you know, so, ma so, ma so much, so many things. I love thinking about the studio as a place where you can incubate a kind of wholeness that acknowledges those connection points. And um, I started thinking that, you know, like maybe I'm entering a, a phase in my life where I don't have to make my own work because I can somehow just be available for other people's projects or, you know, like, um, kind of be like that log that's like melting. And, and then I started thinking about being here at Dartmouth and I was like, yes, 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 that's what I want to do. I'm like, <laughs> how can I get, how can I get some students here to like tell me they need some help and I'll just like be your grunt person, you know, like I can, I can do the etching blanket and I can like, you know, make slabs of clay for you. And like, that sounds so fun. I think this is also why I love the collaborative projects because a lot of it is just labor, you know, but it's like labor in community, which is such a great feeling. And, and you know, when you're making work in the studio, there there's no expertise. I mean, there's expertise in craft, but there's no expertise in being an artist. That doesn't exist as far as I can tell because every new project is its own terms. And its own, like you can have experience with diving into unfamiliar and uncomfortable things, but that doesn't constitute expertise. It's still unfamiliar and uncomfortable, no matter whether you've been doing it for 50 years or, you know, five minutes. So I just feel like, you know, with the absence of expertise, like what are the ways that I can be useful, you know? And um, what, can I, what can I give? So... Um, Anyway, uh, maybe if I ever connect to my Dartmouth email, you can contact me. <laughs> um, but if, if I don't manage it, you can always find me at annahepler at gmail.com. <laughs> um, so uh, that was my leap. Thank you very much. So I'm available for quest Q and A now, but because they're recording this whole thing, <laughs> there's a, a microphone that's going to wander Mike. around the room. So you have to speak into the microphone, and I have to speak into this microphone. That's the game. Any questions? <laughs> they always have questions. It takes like thirty seconds. <laughs> Anna, you have a question? <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about maybe your relationship to color and um, how you feel about that within your practice. I know a lot of the pieces we saw were black and white or neutral, um, besides I think the red inflatable 
So I was wondering if you wanted to talk more about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I was going to say what color, but no, I mean, there's lots of color, right? But it's the usually the color of the materials themselves. And then with some sort of a graphic component, which is usually black or white for me, or has been recently. Um, I think it's probably fear, you know, I mean, to be perfectly honest, like, like there's something about the clarity of a graphic image and then just deciding that the, the endemic materials to the piece are the other colors. That's been a very like happy place. But I, I was thinking, it's funny that you asked this question because I was just on one of my many walks lately thinking about this and I was like, there's something about that clarity that is very violent and very kind of um, um, like a, a deprivation because, you know, nothing is really ever that clear. So the, like manufacturing that kind of clarity is like making all these decisions against the presence of blurrier things. So, so I'd love to tempt myself back into, I've done colorful work before, it's just been a really long time. And I find that with the structure, with the um, sculptural work, I, I think a lot in terms of the structure as a drawing, and I want to make that clear. So maybe I just need to let go of some clarity. I know you're not asking me that, but I, this is where I'm going with it, so. But that's true, not, not much um, color. Excellent uh, lecture. Thank you very much for being here. Um, a lot of your work seems to be about translation from like 2D to 3D or vice versa. Do you take more authorship in the finished product or more of like that how you got there like as the vessel of that translation? Where do you think you fall in that spectrum? Mm, cool question. Um, it, you know, I, I often, when you're going from 2D to 3D and back again, uh, part of it is that you never know what's the art? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're like, is this the art? Wait, no, maybe it's the other, maybe it's the photograph of the thing that's the art, you know? So um, that's the restlessness of it. So I think it, it um, by default, it puts you into a very process-oriented mindset, which I think is what you're asking. Like, I, I, I don't put a huge emphasis on endpoints because I don't know if that's what they are. Or in a rare case, like with some of the big installation pieces, those have more planning in them and they have more of a sense of completion of what they are. But for all the smaller works that are kind of like experimental and then going from 2D to 3D, it's, it's really about like, how can this thing that I just made, you know, let me know what the next thing might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm very interested in your practice of translation more so across mediums and materials than dimensions. And I'm wondering if you ever find the translation to lead to a product that is dishonest or that you feel to be dishonest to its material in any stage. And I'm wondering if, if so, do you, are you, annoyed or off put by that dishonesty or do you somewhat relish in it what do you mean by the dishonesty part just that like the design um and like the form and texture and treatment of the translation is speaking to a material other than itself oh oh oh, oh no that just seems fun to me <laughs> yeah that's like you know like like when when the plywood is sort of hanging and behaving like rope or something that that starts to be its own game I think yeah no, it doesn't annoy me is the answer 
What about like cycles of work? Like, do you have a period where you're like, I'm in cardboard land? <laughs> you know? And then you shift and it's like, oh God, no, 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 clay. Like, how does that work for you? I mean, I understand the translation part. I get that. But like, do you have periods where it's like you just, you're seeing one sort of, like, like, like when you were building with the cardboard and you were mm -hmm. sort of making that almost lace-like piece and you seem, you go there and then you've got, and then you've shifted to the clay. Like, was there a point where you were like, I want to see that? I mean, you sort of said it, but I'm, if you could extrapolate a little more. Yeah, please. no, I, I, I think I'm just really restless. And, and I like having different stages, uh, like, like stations around my studio. And I, I like to have multiple things going at once. And I like to have multiple materials going at once. Every once in a while, there's a deep dive just because of circumstance. Like if I'm doing a residency and it's a, at a ceramics facility, I'm like, this is my chance. You know, so then I, then I get focused on that. And there's always something at the end of a period like that. I'm like, oh, that's how people achieve depth in their work. You know, I'm like, oh, um, but I it, mostly I I kind of move around just out of my own restlessness. Yeah. This is Jerry's workout uh, for the day. It's just gonna. <laughs> um. I really like how you really ask yourself a lot of questions and how you like, oh, how would like this look translated in different um, art languages, I guess. Um, do you have any specific questions that you have that if you're like stuck in like a piece that you'd ask yourself like specifically how you would translate that into different art pieces or to kind of further your process, I guess? I, w I wish um, I wish I could say there was any system. But it it's it's more like things just um, happen. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like it's, it, it, yeah. I I guess along those same lines, like if things just happen, is there ever like times where a piece won't turn out how you want it to, or if that does happen, like? What do you do to go from there? Besides weep and take myself on a long walk or <laughs> like, yeah, no, I mean, you know, obviously the, the more that I'm driving towards a particular outcome, the more dicey it gets, right? So maybe also part of this like restlessness is self-preservation because it's a way that you can be like, oh, I'm not sure, you know, like, and I'm not sure this is the thing that I'm doing. Maybe it's the next thing that's going to be after this. Maybe it's like not in wood that this is a good piece, but if I translate it into fabric, then maybe there'll be something that I learn from it. So I think it, it's the, um, yeah, yeah. But there are plenty of disappointments and um, days where, you know, yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering, like, did you find your work to be cumulative? Like, did the work that you did as a student, like, do you feel like it has built into the work that you're doing now? I guess, like, kind of how, how did you end up here? Did you end up, like, very deep into a different field beforehand as well? Um, because I feel like your work's very abstract now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There, there's secret figures in it, though. This is what I'm noticing. I think that's the other thing, not just color, but maybe figures are coming back in. Um, yeah, is it the same? I mean, I, it's more like the, the attitude about it is the same all the way through, just in the way that we are ourselves and everything we do, our handwriting, the way we make a salad, whatever, you know? Like, you can't help it. It's just in there. Um, I, I feel like I really started with printmaking and book arts. And as I gained in confidence, and, and I think of books as being little architectural forms. And I think as I gained in confidence, I wanted to use like actual architectural spaces, which then shifted my work within them. Um, but I, so there are through lines of one kind or another, but nothing that could foretell one thing or another. And so much of it is, you know, talking about like being um, connected 
to friends and communities as part of my work and also being influenced by my friends and seeing the kind of work that they're making and wondering like, you know, is that a kind of freedom for what I'm trying to say and trying it out? And then that could be a bunch of years <laughs> where you just try something like that. But I, I mean, I guess I, um, yeah, yeah. And I was really interested in what you said about um, being being less interested currently in the hard edges of your identity. And I'm wondering um, what your practice looked like, has looked like in the past when you have been interested in the hard edges of your identity. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think when you're interested in like a fixed narrative about yourself, then you also try to find in the world, like what are the situations and places where you can amplify that fixed narrative. So it might come out as a kind of ambition that plays out in a very specific way. Like, like I would like to have a solo museum show. This is the extension of my hard-edged like sense of self as an artist. That's just an example. So, um, like that. But I'm, yeah. That seems silly. That seems so silly now. <laughs> the translation in your work is just amazing and sort of the way that you can really like when they're side by side you can really see the progression and I think where I'm sort of like it goes beyond that for me is the dynamic 3d sculptures with the inflation oh yeah um how do you is there anything that sparks that is it just sort of organically comes about you mean to to want to do something in motion like that I think originally it was like, how can I fill this huge installation space? And then, you know, and then I thought, oh, you know, I probably was passing like a, a used car lot or something with those like people, you know? I, I mean, it was probably like a chain reaction like that. And I was like, oh, obviously I'll make an inflatable sculpture. <laughs> Sorry. I, I mean, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Can I ask one one last question, then we can go to the opening? Sure. What are you doing here? Uh, yeah, exactly. What are you going to do what this term? What am I doing here? What am I going to do while I'm here? I have my sights set on the letterpress studio in the basement of the library and on the ceramics studio, level three. <laughs> Those are two of the places I hope to hang out. Wonderful. So, but beyond that, I'm not sure. Anna, thank you so much. Everybody, please come to the open. <laughs>